Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Matt coming to you live once again from Rome, from Vatican City, just down the street from the Basilica of St. Peter's, as you can see behind me. Uh, literally just throwing some things together tonight. This is day two of our Synod coverage, RTV at the Synod on Synodality. It's always fun. Uh, we just came out of a book launch, and I know we're here to cover the end of the world and all these crises that are happening in the church, but we keep bumping into things that are so very, very positive. I hope you can hear me over these birds. There's a ton of birds out here. Um, so we just had this, this incredible um, launch of the book Credo, a compendium of the Catholic faith, which was uh, is written by Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Uh, it's, it's being published by Sophia Institute, Institute Press. Uh, so we had Cardinal Sarah here, we had Robert Royal here, we had Jean, uh, Jean Smith here, uh, Diane Montagna, and I just really want to share with you the positive things that are going on as good people react to a really bad situation in the church. And uh, you know, some, some people are saying here that what's happening right now with the Synod on Synodality is the best thing that could happen to the church because it's waking so many people up. We couldn't have survived another sort of conservative tenure here where people pretended to be, you know, preserving tradition and actually they weren't. This pontificate is being very forceful, very direct, very revolutionary in how it's attacking uh, the, the, the traditions of the church and how it wants to institute massive change at every level. And consequently, you have really good news and you have people like Cardinal Sarah, like Bishop Schneider, Cardinal Burke waking up in dramatic fashion. So I want to just compare sort of what happened today in the press hall. Once again, today's press conference, Synodal Press Conference, was all about uh, ecumenism. And the idea was to try to explain how ecumenism had been born out of the Second Vatican Council. When you listen to these people talk, it sounds like everything. There was nothing before Vatican II. So it's kind of sad in a way because they talk about how Vatican II gave us the ecumenical movement, the collegiality. From there, Pope John Paul started the new evangelization, and now the new evangelization has morphed into the, synod the synodal church, whatever that actually means. But again, as I said last night, what we really felt today was just a massive lack of catechetical instruction. These people really don't seem to know what the point and purpose of the church is. I'm, I'm being dead serious. I'm not being pejorative. I almost feel sorry for them because they don't know. So you think back home, you think what, they're, what we're dealing with here in Rome is Karl Rahner and, you know, Schillebex and Hans Kung and all these, you know, really brilliant modernist revolutionaries that are trying to just come in here and destroy the church, right? These are the grandsons of those modernists and granddaughters now. <clears throat> They don't have the same level of understanding of modernism, of theology, of anything else. And what comes out then, for the most part, is, 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 I'm sorry, stupidity. It's inane what's happening here. They're trying to put names on it. They're trying to give us some idea of what synodality means. It's as if they don't even know what it means. <clears throat> and as we saw at yesterday's press conference, they admitted, uh, our, our Bishop um, Borleo ad admitted that only one per less than 1% of the world's Catholics are even paying any attention, have done anything to do with this synod. So, point being, it seems to me that they've lost all sense of doctrine and dogma. They don't even know that they're violating it necessarily. They just have this idea that we're all supposed to be journeying together and you're not sure where they're journeying to. It just seems like the whole point and purpose of the exercise is to walk together, and they keep using these slogans, make the journey, accompaniment, do this together, right? But there doesn't seem to be an end game in place. And when you, when you, when you ask them, when the press asks them what the final objective is, they don't seem to know. The answer typically is more synodality, more dialogue, just going to keep going here. Because we have to have unity, we have to get along. And so they keep congratulating themselves, again, I'm not exaggerating, congratulating themselves that they all get along so famously at their little breakout sessions here at the Synod in the Paul, Paul VI audience hall. And as I'm listening today in the press conference, I'll show you just a, a bit of that in a moment, it occurred to me that of course they're all going to get along. We have Protestants, non-Catholics here, all sorts of you know, Orthodox are here, and they're so patting themselves on the back, we're getting along great. Well, it becomes really obvious to anyone who has any modicum of theology or theological training or catechetical instruction that the reason they're all getting along so well is because the Catholic part of this, the Catholic representatives here at the Synod, are not challenging anyone. They're not saying that you need to become a Catholic, for, for example. The collegiality, or I'm sorry, the ecumenism ultimately is going to bring to people bring people to come back to the Catholic Church, to separate the Protestants, the Orthodox, back to the Catholic. That's not even on the table. So I would say 
that that represents a catechetical nightmare, a doctrinal disaster that these people really don't even understand what the point and purpose of the Catholic Church is anymore. So finally today in the press hall, I just decided I'm going to go up and ask this Cardinal Cook um, a very basic question, and that is, does anyone in the synodal process, anyone at this synod, any of these representatives, any of these cardinals, any of these experts, any of the council fathers, the synodal fathers, are they, are they informing people who are not Catholic that they have to become Catholic, that that's the point of the synod? Is there any admission of that at all anymore? Have they abandoned extra ecclesia nulla salis altogether? And if they haven't uh, abandoned it altogether, how do you reconcile no salvation outside the church with the synodal process that has nothing to do whatsoever with bringing people into the church, into the fullness of the Catholic Church, the one true church founded by Jesus Christ? I went through 12 years of Catholic schools. The nuns drilled it into our heads that you must go out and lovingly invite non-Catholics to come into the fullness of the, church, of the Christian church, the Catholic church, the church founded by Jesus Christ. We didn't get any of that today. Instead, we got the idea that the, that the uh, synodal church begins at baptism, because that's what unites us all, and everything else we were told is minor, is insignificant. Well, of course, to a Catholic myself, like myself, I thought, is the Eucharist insignificant? Because half of these dialogue and synodal partners are not Catholic. They don't believe Christ is present in the Eucharist. So now are we saying that Christ doesn't matter, that a person's take on the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, the heretical take, a Catholic, doesn't matter what that is, as long as you're baptized, that's the main thing, we're all together in this? These are the things that, that just simply are not being addressed at this synod. So finally, I just went up and asked this Cardinal Cook well, if they still are requiring their, their representatives to point out to non-Catholics that it is necessary to become a Catholic, and here's what that looked like. Is it necessary to invite people to come to the Catholic faith? And then if you say, which of the consequences is the first? Okay, then you know, we are not doing the same thing. I see, okay. That's what that says, uh, how many people uh, need the uh, assembly of a community that the church doesn't grow by proselytism, but Attraction. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, His Eminence, he was gracious. You could see that the, 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 the organizers of the press conference were trying to sort of pull him away. He was trying to be kind. He wanted to answer my question. This is what I meant before. I don't sense this really aggressive, bad guy. He just doesn't know. So at the end, when you finally get him to answer the question, albeit halfway, he does say that our example leads people towards Catholicism. That didn't come out officially at all in this synod. But privately, he's basically saying, yeah, that you don't proselytize, but you lead them into the church by example. Apparently is what he's saying. But that's not the official line. So that's why tonight, I just came out of this, this book, book launch, the Credo, the Compendium of Catholic Faith by, uh, by Bishop Schneider, and it just struck me, it hit me like a punch to the chest, how important the work of Bishop Schneider is right now, because we just came out of a press conference in which even cardinals and bishops and lay experts representing the Synod are so under-catechized that it makes you sad. It makes you want to cry for them. It's preposterous that these people have been so dumbed down in the Catholic faith. So what Bishop Schneider, what His Excellency has done, is he's written a book, it's all question and answers, it's all very short questions and answers, almost like the old Baltimore Catechism, only it's an updated catechism. So it, as, using tradition, using Trent, using Aquinas, the teachings of the church, he, he addresses things like gay marriage and you know uh, drug use and transsexualism and gender ideology, all the things that are not yet, that are not in the Baltimore Catechisms. And it seems to me, listening to so many people, including Cardinal Sarah in here, talking about a crisis at the highest levels of the church, almost nothing is more important in terms of a book, of, of what could come out right now, what needs to come out right now. He dedicated, Bishop Schneider dedicates this book to mothers, who are the first ones to teach and evangelize, who give the faith with the mother's milk to their children. This book is written for families, and it just seemed like it was, the, the hand of God was so providential that right now, coming out of, in the middle of this synod, 
that you have a, a, a prince of the church like Bishop Snyder who says, you know what we need to do? We need to teach the Catholic world, teach the sheep what to believe, what is Catholic and what isn't Catholic. And that's where, that's where my enthusiasm comes from tonight. I just, listening to Bishop Snyder just now, I just was, I came out absolutely convinced that God is in, in, involved with what he's doing, with what Bishop Snyder is doing, that this all, is all very providential. And then you could say, well, yeah, yeah, but you know, he, he, should, he should speak out more about the crisis in the church. Guess what? He did. There was a gentleman, a news reporter from Reuters, a correspondent from Reuters in here, who at the end of this, of this little uh, book launch tonight, challenged Bishop Schneider. Your Excellency, Phil Pulella, I, I'm a correspondent for Reuters. Um, and how do you see your role? I would venture to say that most of the people in this room are very critical of the current pontiff. Um, so how do you see your role in, 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 in talking to the Pope? Will you be seeing him while you're here? First, um, my relationship with the Pope, of course, he is the Peter of our time. Um, I am as a bishop, the member of the college, collegium of the bishops, and so the most, and the relationship with the Pope is uh, brothers, the fraternity first. The Pope is not a boss, you know, in, in a worldly way, manner, and the bishops are not employees. This would be very worldly, and this is not correct. Our Lord Jesus Christ said to Peter, exactly, Peter, and to the apostles, do not dominate your brothers. And so, therefore, the bishops must have the freedom also to speak to the Pope. Otherwise, there is no true fraternal relationship. When I am not able or when I am fearing that when I will speak even an admonition with reverence, of course, to the Pope to help him then we have no fraternal relationship. There is no true collegiality. There is fear. And this should not be in the church. And even Pope Francis, uh, he sometimes uh, called the bishops to have the paresia. It means this is a free speech. And he likes this. And, and this I try to do, and I, but always in the res respectful form. This is important. So, and when I am in my conscience as a bishop seeing some dangers for the entire body of the church, we are a family, the church is not a, an NGO, or uh, we are a family. In a family, you can, you can say to the father or to the elder brother respectfully, also some admonitions. And this, this, this climate should be in the church, but this is missing. I am seeing bishops are intimidated many, they don't uh, have the courage to say something, for the love for the Pope even. And this, when I am doing, I am really saying this in all my conscience, it is for love for him, for real brotherly love. And I will tell him, Holy Father, I am your best friend. I have never prayed so much for no one in my life as for Pope Francis, really. And when I made some statements, even publicly, I did this for love for him, to help him, as St. Paul did to Peter in Antioch, or as some saints did in the past, St. Bridget, St. Catherine of Siena, they addressed the popes with very clear statements. And so, I think this should be our climate in the church, a spiritual. The second part of his question was, what did you think of the dubia of Cardinal Burke and the, the latest dubia of Cardinal Burke and the other cardinals? Yes, the dubia, yes. I consider the dubia presented by the five cardinals, inclusively the present cardinal here, Robert Sarra, is a great work. It will go down in history as a um, heroic act, I think. It will go down in history. We should live not for this time. We should live for next 100, 200 years, and for eternity. This is, this matters. Not was today is, is said about this, but this is objectively, I think it was a must needed action of the cardinals to present the Pope de Dubia in clarity. And I think it is a meritorious heroic act. 
Clara Jean Gravet, Religion News Service. Since we're on topic, I would like to know what you, both of you, uh, think about the answers that Pope Francis provided regarding the dubia. The answers the Pope provided are unfortunately unsatisfactory. Uh, they cause more dubia than resolved. We have to be honest. We cannot make here some fictions and to lie one to another. It would be not honest. We are not little children. We have to be honest. The answers was confusing, vague, and an art of, art of confusion, really, the answers. This must be stated. Unfortunately, we have to, to state this and then to pray for the Pope to help him, maybe to give them more clear answers to help him. Bottom line, friends, there's a lot to be discouraged about right now at the Senate. Believe me, it's, it's an exercise in, in, in torment in many ways. It's mind-numbingly uh, 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 astonishing what they're trying to do here and how stupid it all is. But as I said at the top of this show tonight, there's also wonderful and powerful and beautiful things happening that I want you all to pray for. Don't give up on this process. Don't give up on some of the, of the bishops. And, and the, the number is growing. Just tonight, Cardinal Sarah, Bishop Schneider. Um, but what they're trying to do here. And there's, a, there's many more of them. They're working together. And I really have a lot of confidence that out of this synod, a synod which is really waffling, they've kind of given up on the women priests and the deacons. And you don't know, really, they don't seem to know what to say at this point. Doesn't seem to be a whole lot going on here other than they're testing the waters and they're not liking the fact that there's been a lot of resistance. I think what might come out of this resistance, out of this synod, is more Catholic, thoroughly catechized Catholic resistance than anyone has seen in the church, maybe in 50 or 60 years. Because of the nature of the crisis, what the synodal process represents, the crisis in the church, the crisis in leadership that it represents, I think that's going to really elevate the counter-revolution, which you're a part of, which I'm a part of. And I would just say from Rome tonight, I encourage you all, please, tonight, pray for Bishop Schneider, pray for Cardinal Berg, pray for the ones who right now are on the front line. And believe me, friends, believe me, please, I've been in and out of the press, count, press hall here at the Vatican all week. It's making a difference. The resistance that you're making, that I'm making, but especially that these princes of the church are making, you can feel it, you can see it. It's making a difference. To the extent where just yesterday we showed you one of the council fathers, the Archbishop uh, Abrolio, came right out and said, I stand with the Latin Mass Catholics. Those people are good. They're, they're, they're te keeping the faith. They're handing it down. Really surprising things are happening, friends, and happening, friends, and I believe it's because of prayer and it's because of resistance. We resist Francis to his face with respect, and it's working. I honestly believe that. So continue to pray for that. And keep track of these uh, these little posts. We're gonna keep on keep on keeping on all week here from Rome. Thank you so much. Please spread the word that we're doing this. Uh, follow us on Twitter and everything else. We're gonna let you know uh, when we post. Like tonight, totally spur of the moment. So God bless you. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you soon.